my favorite movie of all time. Buckle up. This is going to be a big video. Actually, I have two favorite movies. Actually, I don't have a favorite movie because what kind of serious person would have a favorite movie? Let me put it this way, though. There are two movies that have defined the last five or six years of my cinematic life and my real life. Two movies for which there is a before and an after. They changed absolutely everything, and this is one of them. The other one, if you know me, uh, maybe you know what it is, but that's a story for another day. This movie, E.E., is probably the most well-known film by Taiwanese director Edward Yong. Edward Yong originally studied to be an engineer, and he got a job as an engineer in Seattle, Washington. This was the early days of computer engineering. He worked on microprocessors. You might know that I am a software engineer, and I grew up not too far away from Seattle, Washington. One day, Edward Young saw the movie Aguirre, The Wrath of God, the Werner Herzog film, and apparently this was the beginning of his journey back to cinema and back to Taiwan, where he kicked off the Taiwanese New Wave alongside two other directors whose names I can't really pronounce. Edward Young died in 2007. He was 59. Probably had a lot more to say. Even though his career was cut short, he still managed to make arguably two of the greatest films ever, uh, to change global cinema profoundly, and to change my life. Edward Young, interesting guy. He was married to pop star Sai Chin, not to be confused with another, well, an actress named Sai Chin. The one in question uh, sang the song Forgotten Time, which is featured in the movie Infernal Affairs. That's the movie that The Departed was based on. I mention all of this because after Sai Chin and Young divorced, he went on to marry Kylie Peng, a pianist who plays the score for the film Yi Yi and who was involved with the Lincoln Center's retrospective on Edward Young, which ended yesterday. Kylie Peng was actually at the first screening of Yi Yi to introduce the film. Sadly, I wasn't at that screening. I was at a later one, but I had the immense, immense good fortune to see two Edward Young films uh, at Lincoln Center, this one and a Confucian Confucian. Both movies were packed. Uh, Yi Yi had a line out the door. There was a huge standby line, and it really warmed my heart to see so many people who weren't going to get into the movie because they didn't plan ahead. No, just to see so many people uh, coming out to appreciate this amazing, amazing film. It's hard to know where to start with E.E. E. It's such an enormous and deep film. It's just under three hours, which is about an hour shorter than A Brighter Summer Day, which came out nine years earlier. Um, I have seen A Brighter Summer Day, and I think it is probably Young's best movie. It's the longest, so it's got to be the best. A uh, Brighter Summer Day is a real, almost uncontested contender for the greatest film ever made. But E.E. E. has always spoken a little bit more to me. If you've never seen an Edward Young movie, E.E. E. is where you should start. This one. Go watch it. Anyway, um, the movie it has a huge plot. They cram a lot into three hours. It almost feels like a soap opera at times as it tells this interwoven story of a family in Taipei, all the different members, all the different generations, all their friends, their relatives... Rather than try to summarize all the threads, I want to introduce you to the movie in terms of its themes. There are a lot of themes. This might take a while. Maybe one of the most central things in this movie is the idea of partnership and love. The title of the film doesn't translate exactly to English. Sometimes you hear it called a one and a two. That's actually the official subtitle of the film. Interesting that the official subtitle would be in English. I guess the Chinese title means one and one, which is sort of the way that you write Two, there's a lot of linguistic subtlety here that I'm not going to attempt to, uh, to express, but the title seems to be alluding in some way to this idea of partnership. When you put two individuals together, there is a third thing. One and one, does it make two? I don't know. Sounds silly, but I think there's kind of a profound thing here. What exactly is a pairing, a partnership, a relationship? We see this question all over the movie, and we see pairing. We see mirroring. We see doubles all over the movie. Just about every character in the film considers coupling. They grapple with it. Uh, at some point, they grapple with what it means to be with another person or to be alone or both at the same time. I guess I'm already hinting at another big thing about the movie, which is uncertainty. If you've seen other videos on this channel, you may have heard me talk about uncertainty before. I tend to say that it's my favorite thing about a movie. The best movies are the ones that have uncertainty in them, something like that. I started thinking that because of this movie, right? And in fact, this channel is a mess. There's a ton of different movies here, but if there's one thread that unifies them all, it's an interest in psychological realism and maybe more so humanism. That interest was engendered in me by this 
movie. I cannot overstate how much it shaped my cinematic life. Um, yeah. I don't think it's an understatement to say that beyond reshaping my cinematic life, uh, the movie also set in motion a huge shift in how I thought about uncertainty in the real world. Uncertainty in the real world. Mm. There's some of that, it turns out. Anyway, the twists and turns of the romantic relationships in this film, they aren't triumphant and they aren't exactly tragic. Nothing in the movie is. And it's not that the movie is ambiguous. It's not that it leaves problems unresolved. It's not that it has some big cliffhanger at the end. But the resolutions are nuanced. They are the ebbs and flows of life and the seasons. It's hard to describe, but it's amazing how powerful the movie can be without being a tragedy or a celebration. It's amazing how potent the emotions can be when they're also so nuanced. It reminds you, again, of life. There are some ideas about regret in this movie. That's one theme. Looking back and forward in time, I think maybe you can regret the future as well as the past. At least I think I do. Regret and uncertainty almost always go hand in hand. This movie rejects the myth of hindsight in some ways. Uh, thinks about reminiscing in, in a poignant way, in a way that's, that's quite different from the somewhat mechanical sort of flashback reminiscences of a lot of films. Sight, more generally, is also a big idea in the movie. One of the characters in the film is a young boy named Yang Yang. This film mainly centers around a family, and there's a young child in the family named Yang Yang. He tells his dad at one point that people can really only see half of things because they don't have eyes on the back of their heads. This is a somewhat childish thing to say, but there is something here about what we can see and what we can't see. Are things really as they appear? Yang Yang tries to overcome this difficulty with a camera, and the results are one of my favorite parts of the movie. One of the best lines from the film comes from Ting Ting, Yang Yang's older sister. She asks her grandmother at one point why... The world is so different from how we thought it was. Hmm. Part of this uncertainty, part of this lack of clarity might be human nature, but there's something else going on here too. Yi Yi is inherently an urban film. One of the most universal themes of the Taiwanese New Wave is related to rapid industrialization. Taiwan was a small, traditional agrarian society that went through a technology boom, an economic miracle, you might say. It turned into a city overnight. This is true of a lot of parts of East Asia, but Taipei is one of the poster children for it. Hong Kong is another one, and it's perhaps no coincidence that those two cities produced so many amazing movies in this era. Of course, filmmakers in those places also weren't restricted, like the ones in mainland China. As you might expect, um, at first you might expect a movie set in Taiwan um, to, to not really echo a Western life very much. But in fact, I think this idea of rapid modernization is deeply salient to viewers like me. The film is working on a personal level here, showing us alienation, showing us the tensions of internal life, but it's working on a broader scope too. There are a bunch of shots in this movie that bridge the individual and the city. For instance, there are a lot of shots taken from the outside of a window that show a character inside a building or a car, but also show the city outside. We have the internal and the external, the public and the private. Maybe one of the most noticeable, the most famous, the most talked about uh, one of these shots is when Min Min, the mother of Yang Yang and Ting Ting, is looking out at the city at night. And yes, the family all has double names except for the dad, NJ, which is short for New Jersey. I don't think it is. Perhaps uh, this is another nod to the title of the movie and this idea of pairing. Anyway, it's kind of a pain to put a reflection in a movie because there's a risk that you're going to end up showing the camera. But Yang was clearly pretty committed to the significance of these reflections and these moments that merge the internal and the external. It's interesting to see your reflection in a window because it's kind of there and kind of not there. It, it really merges you with the outside, superimposes one thing onto the other or perhaps the other way around. In this particular scene with Min Min, there is a little red flashing light somewhere out in the city that happens to fall right where her heart is. There are countless examples of how this movie weaves intimate internal life into the city. There are relatively simple things like the shots of the family apartment that are backgrounded by a highway, but there are also some more complex dynamics. For example, there's a young couple in this movie that always meets at the same place. It's really just a square of pavement, but it's given all these emotional implications. In the city, uh, the drama of your life is defined by places and things like this, little landmarks that might be totally inconsequential, 
totally inert in some ways, but are actually endowed with a with a sort of personal meaning. And it's crazy to think that everywhere you go, you're maybe surrounded by these landmarks of other people's lives. Urbanism kind of always goes hand in hand with technology. And that's another big theme in EE, technology. In some ways, you might not really expect this movie to have much to do with technology because it's this social drama. It's the psychological realism. But like I said, you're one step from urbanism to technology. EE has some conspicuous technological moments. And honestly, this might be one of the few things about the movie that I don't totally love, that hasn't aged completely gracefully. Some of the moments are fine. We see some pagers, for instance, and there's some CCTV cameras that show up. Uh, the movie kicks off with some. But there's some moments that are a little bit more jarring. NJ works at a company that develops software. And in particular, they're looking into hiring a Japanese developer to build a video game. The way that this business is conducted is a little bit vague. And, you know, it's not at all like how most people would think of tech companies today. It's not a modern tech company. Um, Edward Young's earlier film, The Confucian Confusion, actually focuses really deeply on life in an office. It's a great movie, more humorous, um, I think. It feels like a way more thorough look at this office environment and sort of the formal economy of Taiwan. In EE, some of NJ's coworkers are a little bit two-dimensional. The plot feels a little bit simplistic. Um, that's the, maybe the one piece of the movie that doesn't feel as thorough as this stuff at the office. The film makes two interesting references to video games. The first one is when one of the characters in the film is getting an ultrasound, and you know she's seeing her, her baby on this monitor for the first time. And while we look at that image, we hear the audio of a meeting at NJ's work where the Japanese developer is pitching an idea about a video game that is a simulation of life. It's interesting juxtaposition. Later, there is an abrupt moment of violence in the film. Uh, I won't spoil it, but you're not going to see it coming, most likely. We never see this actually happen, but we, we see a news report about it. And then the film cuts to showing us a video game that shows something similar to what might have happened, sort of a video game reenactment that's maybe alleging something about video games and society or something like that. Both of these moments might feel a little bit dated, dare I say, might feel a little bit boomer y. Of course, this movie is almost 25 years old, um, but everything else has aged <laughs> quite well. Interestingly, this film was made on the verge of Y2K and was originally thought of um, by Yong as his Y2K project. Remember, he worked with computers. He was apparently pretty interested in what might happen at the turn of the millennium, um, especially its broad, potentially very broad social implications. Even if these moments rub me the wrong way a little bit, even if they're slightly weak, and I mean, again, nitpicking here in what is truly one of the greatest films ever made. So even if they're slightly weak, I do think they serve a purpose. And at the very least, it's a, it's a hint that something postmodern is going on here. Um, and of course, they also, especially the first moment, the, this birth, the simulation of life, they take us back to one of the film's biggest and greatest themes, which is just life itself. E.E. E. covers birth and death and everything in between, and maybe more so than anything I've ever seen, it is simply a movie about life. Okay, that's the introduction to some of the, the film's themes. Let me zoom into a few things that I think are interesting. First, I want to talk about hotels, hallways, and elevators, which are all rectangles, rectangular prisms to be precise, and there's a lot of these things in the movie. There's a lot of hotels in the movie. We open with a wedding in a hotel, which has this big lobby that is really the convergence of the traditional and commercial. It has kind of this traditional design, but also it's a hotel where international commerce is taking place. That's interesting. Rapid industrialization strikes again. There's another party in a hotel later. Uh, NJ goes to Japan at one point. He, he spends a bunch of time in a hotel there where he speaks to the staff in English. There's a romantic interlude in a hotel at one point. The family home here even kind of looks like a hotel. It's an apartment in a big rectangular building. Of course, all these places have hallways and elevators. Elevators are people movers in the truest sense, and they're a great place to bump into one another. The film kicks off with NJ bumping into an old friend in an elevator, or who's just gotten out of an elevator. As they're talking in front of the elevator, another old friend comes down the hallway, um, or another, another old friend comes down uh, and, and bumps into them as well. Elevators, they have this central role in the dramatic logic. And it's interesting that it's technology kind of interceding in your life directly. Outside the family apartment, there's a hallway, which is the site of a bunch of drama. People 
are bumping into each other, seeing things they perhaps shouldn't be. This is a movie where liminal and technological spaces are a huge part of the dramatic logic. Um, I think we can maybe abstract a little bit, too, uh, to look at almost the entirety of this postmodern city as a bunch of rectangles linked together. Uh, some sort of graph where collecting points are joined by hallways and highways. You've got boxes, hallways, and highways. And I mean, they're, they're all kind of rectangles at the end of the day. There's another Taiwanese New Wave film called Vive la Amour, um, directed by Sai Ming Long, one of the directors whose name I refused to pronounce earlier. Uh, it has one scene in it that I will always remember, and it's not the legendary ending. <laughs> um, it's a moment where we visit a columbarium, which is essentially a tomb, uh, a bunch of burial vaults together in a, in a store, kind of. One of the characters in the movie is a salesman for burial vaults at this place. This is kind of a grim movie, salesman for burial vaults. Burial vaults. That's my dream career. This is a weird place because in some ways, it's not that different from a storefront that you would find in a city, uh, any other, you know, shop that would, like a bookstore or something, but inside the shelves are stocked with ashes. They're just rows and rows of these vaults with, uh, you know, human remains inside. To me, the shelves, the vaults, they look like big rows of apartment buildings. Vive le Amour is a movie about three people who live in the same apartment without really being aware of each other. So it really dramatizes doors and hallways, and this parallel to death is interesting too. Now, this movie is much more grim than E.E., but I think this is a pretty interesting example of sort of the, the geometry of the postmodern city. Another example, maybe I should have started with this one, is the grocery store. Uh, don't big grocery stores with all of their aisles kind of look like cities? Hmm. Or if you made it all really small, might it look a little bit like a microchip? So anyway, there's, there's maybe some sort of postmodern geometry all over this film. I guess I'm getting a, a bit abstract, but I think... It's one of the things to, to think about here. Um, in, in Yang's earlier film, A Confucian Confusion, he doubles down on a lot of these ideas, actually. Elevators have an even bigger role in that movie. There's a great scene towards the end where there's two people chasing each other around, and they have to go in the elevator. So they're like sprinting after each other, and one gets in the elevator, and the next person has to wait for the next elevator. Again, this uh, modern technological thing interceding very directly in the drama. That film also has a bunch of intertitles, some of which might be a bit on the nose, most of which are pretty cool, though, and there's a few of them that allude even more directly to some of these ideas. For instance, one of them says something like, when the fake is more real than the real. This could easily be a direct quote from Baudrillard. Uh, if you ask Baudrillard, by the way, what the ultimate postmodern building would look like, he would probably say the Pompidou Center, not the Bonaventure Hotel. But speaking of that, Frederick Jameson actually wrote about Edward Young at one point, mainly about his film The Terrorizers. Um, it's kind of a dense uh, little chapter he, he wrote about, and I don't agree with all the things in it, but I'll mention one term that he uses, which is synchronous monadic simultaneity. Now, this is some classic academic obfuscation. A, a monad is simply a singular unit, one thing, an atomic thing, you know? Uh, this term is basically talking about a bunch of individuals, a bunch of monads, living together, you know, synchronously, um, coexisting paradoxically, I guess. And look, that's what city life is all about. It's a huge part of EE. This is a movie with five plot lines going forward at the same time. What could be more city-like than that? We've got people bumping into each other all over the place, people struggling to understand what their attachments really mean and what they amount to. Whew. It's worth noting that people like Baudrillard and Jameson tend to be pretty pessimistic about the postmodern world, which they tend to characterize by the impossibility of truth and meaning, I guess, as grim stuff. And I don't think Yee really supports such a dark forecast. Um, there's definitely disillusionment here and uncertainty, but I wouldn't call the movie a tragedy. Anyway, so the point is, this is to some degree a postmodern film and I guess a postmodern city to live in. Anyway, I could talk about this movie for hours, but I think there are a couple more things that are really worth touching on. Earlier when I was talking about how universal this movie is, um, I, I maybe swept under the rug a little bit how local it also is, right? The geopolitics of this movie are fairly complicated, and I don't quite have the knowledge to, to get to the bottom of anything here, but I want to talk about it a little bit, what this movie means as a Taiwanese movie in particular. There are a couple different countries in play in this movie. Obviously, it mainly takes place in Taiwan, but NJ's company tries to make a deal with a Japanese uh, uh, developer, 
And that's why NJ goes to Japan um, as well. Now, in a lot of movies from mainland China, the portrayal of Japan is negative. If you select a random historical film from mainland China, for instance, it's probably going to be about a Japanese atrocity during World War II. I guess that's one of the few non-controversial historical events in uh, the history of China. It's a lot easier than making a movie about the Cultural Revolution or Tiananmen Square. Shout out to Summer Palace. In this movie, we have a, a totally different thing going on, a very different view of Japan. The developer that NJ works with, his name's Ota, is a really endearing character, a special character, a magician of sorts, and maybe the only character in the film who seems to be at peace. Maybe the grandmother, too, but one of the, one of the few characters who seems to actually know what they're doing in this world. NJ and Ota have a dual relationship. They have a business relationship, and they have a friendship. And of course, these different things end up being at odds with each other. I don't really have the knowledge to make a lot of claims here, but you wonder if this is an allegory to national relationships more generally. I don't know if that's what the relationship between Japan and Taiwan is like, but maybe on a different level, you might wonder if this is what Taiwan feels like. Not that a country would feel exactly, but if, if there's some sense of detachment in Taiwan uh, that mirrors the type of detachment that NJ feels and that, that echoes his struggles to connect um, internationally. NJ is played by Nian Zhen Wu, that may be why his name's NJ, by the way, um, who was a big figure in the Taiwanese New Wave. I think he was in four Edward Yong movies, and he also wrote a bunch of films. In this movie, he doesn't actually look like a famous actor. I don't, I don't mean to roast the guy. Uh, I'll say it's, it's a great job of sort of acting like a dad, and like an everyman. Um, but, you know, he's a famous an actor, emblematic in some ways. And again, you wonder if this character is standing in for something much bigger than just one dad. Yee Yee also alludes to the United States and the West more generally. Oda and NJ talk to each other in English. Sherry, NJ's first love, lives in the United States. Some of Yang's other movies uh, allude to the U.S. more directly, like A Brighter Summer Day involves Elvis. Um, I don't know exactly what to make of this, but I suspect that in addition to being an inherently modern place, maybe Taiwan is also an inherently global place. Through its rapid modernization, through its history of contention, Taiwan became not just a rock in the ocean, but again, a vertex in some big global network. Maybe it is a rectangle of its own. Okay, I've got one more thing to talk about, which is the vision of filmmaking itself that is alluded to in this movie. Uh, film people always like to talk about this. I've, I've talked a little bit already about how Yang Gong has a camera. He uses it to take pictures of the back of people's heads to show them what they would never otherwise see. Uh, unless, I guess, they had two mirrors, unless they went to the barber shop or something. But you wonder if this hints at what the purpose of a film might be, to show people what they haven't, what they can't see on their own. There is also some more explicit discussion of movies. There's a character called Fatty in the film. He's the boyfriend of Ting Ting's neighbor. Her name is Lily, another double name. Fatty has some opinions about movies. He's a bit of an intellectual. And he says, for instance, that, some, that people today live longer because of movies. Uh, they get to experience all these things that they wouldn't be able to otherwise experience. I don't think the movie is necessarily putting this forward as the singular purpose of film, but it's worth thinking about. The art that features most prominently in the movie is actually not visual. There is a lot of music in this movie. In fact, I really should have talked about this in the earlier section about themes, because music is a big theme here. Ota plays the piano, Ting Ting plays the piano, Lily plays the cello, and Jay is always listening to his headphones. Edward Yang actually briefly appears in this movie as a piano player. Yang was married to two different musicians, uh, so the guy likes music, okay? But I think there may also be something a little bit deeper here, which is just how musical um, Edward Yang's films tend to be. Some people might say poetic, I guess, but Yi Yi is in some ways a song like some, some great concerto or something like that. Um, it's a movie like a great concerto. Uh, so look, I have a lot more that I could say, but I'll just finish with a, with a slightly personal note, um, which is that, yes, this is still my favorite movie. Um, I, I reviewed, uh, at the end of last year, I reviewed Underground, which was a previous favorite and which got displaced basically by EE, my roster of former favorites. That, that whole system went out the window when I saw this movie, essentially, um, 
when I when I rewatched that, I had no idea what I would expect of it. I I didn't. I thought, man, is this just gonna be like? Will I be embarrassed that I ever liked it? And there was a slight sense of uncertainty, maybe, in seeing E.E. about you know how I would feel about it now. But yeah, still such an incredible movie. The one thing that struck me though is that this time seeing the film, it it was a little bit different for me in that. When I watched this movie in college, I remember thinking of it as being a brutally emotional film. And it is an emotional film. It is excruciating in some ways. But I didn't find it anywhere near as sad, I guess, as I used to. And that's interesting. I watched a little video of Kylie Peng's introduction to the film uh, that she did the night that I was not at the screening. And she said that Edward Young hoped that the movie would be like a friend that you could return to year after year after year. And, you know, sometimes I think it's a, I think people get a little bit ahead of themselves and they say, oh, you know, I, I love watching movies over the course of my life and seeing how, I cha- how, you know, they change and how I change. And then the movie they're talking about is like, you know, Bob the Builder or something. But E.E. is a movie that I'm sure is going to be with me for my life. Well, who knows? I mean, I think it will be. Um, and I can't overstate how sort of comforting it was to rewatch. I mean, it also was a, was a very emotional experience, but just how comforting it was to see this amazing film again. So, yeah, if you haven't seen it and you've made it this far, well, what are you doing? you got to watch the movie. If you have seen it, I would say try watching it again.